when I was writing my PhD at the University of Sydney, I actually spent the last month of my PhD sitting in this very library at ACOR, bleeding through my fingertips, trying to finish it in time. And I walked into the library the other day and I just got a tingle down my spine. And that's more than just the smiling face of Humi that you always see. It was because I just felt that same sort of sense of liberation that I remember sitting in the library and pressing submit and having it finally uh, off my shoulders and I could go and explore some of the sites in Jordan. So it's really nice for me to be back here and to have this opportunity to speak to ACOR. And I thank ACOR, Barbara and her staff for giving me this opportunity to speak. And I thank you all very much for coming along tonight. What I'd like to speak about tonight is my research into dolmen monuments and particularly how we've approached dolmens as archaeologists in the past and how that approach perhaps tells us more about ourselves in the present than it does about the behaviour of people in the deep archaeological past. And then I want to have a look at briefly about a new way of looking at dolmens based on some field work that I did in the Wadi Rayan in North Jordan. Um, but before we get on to that, I think we need to start with the absolute fundamentals and that, well, what do I mean by the word dolmen? And I think this is a pretty good example. As you'll see in a moment, there's a bit of a problem with how we define dolmens. But essentially for my talk, I'm talking about something like this. The word dolmen is an old medieval French word. It means a table of stone dolmen. And I think that's the best description. A vertical slab, a vertical slab, and a horizontal slab covering the top. These above ground stone chambers served almost certainly as burial monuments and in fact there's a lot of data to suggest that they served as burial chambers for many people, 20, 25 people all together at once. Now, dolmens are very rarely found in the archaeological landscape themselves individually they often cluster together in groups, sometimes 10, 12, 100, over a thousand monuments together, all above the ground. So can you imagine walking through one of these dolmen cemeteries with these big stone charnel houses full of your ancestors, not below the ground like a graveyard, but physically around you? I think it would have been a really spooky, eerie experience. And that's why I've called this, the title of this talk, The Visible Dead. That visibility, that monumentality has been what is, that's captured the imagination of archaeologists for the last 200 years. But it's paradoxically also why we know so very little about them. Of course, dolmens are seen, because they're seen by us, they're also seen by tomb robbers. And almost every single dolmen that is found has been found robbed out. And that's created what's called the dolmen problem. We've got very, very little data on which we can anchor our chronologies, on which we can kind of tether our ideas. And so the situation is very amorphous. Um, our, our approaches to dolmens over the last 200 years have kind of floated on the various uh, theoretical currents that have risen and, and fallen in archaeological thought. It's a situation that's kind of like our approach to Stonehenge, um, that very famous Archaeologist Jaquetta Hawkes made a throwaway remark about Stonehenge, which I think is very apt here. We get the Stonehenge we deserve, she remarked quite wryly. And I think perhaps maybe we've got the dolmens we deserve as well. Now, if you open a book about dolmens today, and incidentally, that book Barbara showed, the megalithic Monuments of uh, Jordan by Guy Sheltimer is the first book you should go to if you ever want to go out in the countryside and visit these things because it is absolutely, absolutely the best guidebook for taking a picnic to a dolmen field and I highly recommend everyone get it. But I've earned my keep now, I think. <laughs> but if you do open any real book on dolmens today, despite this dolmen problem, there is a general consensus that dolmens are part of a megalithic phenomenon. And there's kind of two assumptions in that. The first is that dolmens are regional, that they're found from the foothills of the Taurus Mountains all the way down to the Yemeni coast. And the second is that dolmens are enduring, 
And then scholars still debate the exact time, but they span the entire fourth and the third millennia BC, and some even say tail off on either side. Now, archaeologists have tried to devise a mechanism to explain this ubiquity in time and space, and traditionally anyway, that mechanism has been nomads, people moving throughout the landscape for long periods of time. I don't agree with that approach of dolmens as a megalithic phenomenon, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. But first, though, I want to unpack that concept, that approach of, of a megalithic phenomenon, and trace those embedded assumptions all the way back to the very beginning of uh, scholarship in the Levant when dolmens first came on the radar of certainly European scholars. We're going back 200 years. Now, almost exactly 200 years, the end of March, if you had been standing in the Jordan Valley at that very famous dolmen field of Damia, what you would have seen would have been two Royal Navy officers galloping down the Wadi Zarka on their horses, and they suddenly stopped and confronted a dolmen. They were the first European scholars ever to see a dolmen in the Near East. What was really striking about their account was that they were familiar with what they, with what they saw. And they compared it to dolmens, of course, which are found in considerable numbers in Western Europe and the British Isles. And they even referenced this particular dolmen in Kent, near where one of them had grown up. Now think about that. Because not everything in the archaeological landscape was familiar at that time. Superimposed ancient settlements, one on top of the other, these European scholars had to borrow the Arabic word tell. But not so dolmen. They were quite comfortable by taking this medieval French word and plopping it into the Middle East. By bringing that European term into the Middle East, they brought with them two fundamental assumptions. The first, which was very common, of course, in the 19th century, was that there had been a trajectory of civilization, that civilization had started in the Middle East and had reached its apogee in 19th century Europe. The second assumption, and this one has been very long lived, was that it was perfectly natural to assume that these dolmens on opposite sides of this big, broad region were built by the same common cultural context simply because they had used large stone slabs. The use of large stone slabs was a sufficient index to associate uh, commonality. These assumptions became codified in archaeological thought in the first half of the 20th century with theories of diffusionism. Now, I know I don't need to tell an educated uh, audience at ACOR such as yourselves what exactly diffusionism is, so please indulge me. But diffusionism is an archaeological theory that states that something is developed once. Agriculture, metallurgy, megalithic monuments. And from that point of origin, it spreads out, usually spread by migrating groups of people. Now, the father of prehistory, Veer Gordon Child, was the chief proponent of this theory of diffusionism. He is, I think, the second most art famous archaeologist of all time, and I have to point out, the graduate of the University of Sydney. <laughs> and Gordon Child, in that theory he, he uh, outlined, saw megalithic monuments in Europe, megalithic monuments in the Levant, and that became one of the central struts supporting this whole edifice. And he spoke about migrating people from the Middle East through the Mediterranean into Europe, and he described them as, and I quote him, the apostles of the megalithic faith. Now, just as a quick aside, the most famous archaeologist of all time is, of course, Indiana Jones. <laughs> And I don't know if you saw the last Indiana Jones movie, but if you did, you might remember he's on a motorbike with his son being chased by the KGB, and they're riding the motorbike through one of the university libraries. They fall off, skid to a halt, and one of Indiana Jones' students leans forward and says to him, Dr. Jones, and asks him a question about his assignment. And as Indiana picks up the motorbike and speeds off, he says, read Gordon Child and his theory on diffusionism. <laughs> so now you know. 
he, he also said at the same time, I think, uh, if you want to be an archaeologist, get out of the library. And I heartily agree with those words. <laughs> anyway, I digress. Theories of diffusionism, of course, have long since fallen out of out of uh, accepted dogma. In the 1950s, the development of radiocarbon dating proved, I think, that megalithic monuments in Europe often were earlier than those in the Middle East, and now we all accept that developments such as agriculture and metallurgy could be developed by different people at different times and in different places and in different ways. But remember the current theory about a megalithic phenomenon I said? I think in that current theory, you can still hear echoes of the assumptions of diffusionism. The dolmens are regional, the dolmens are enduring, that the tradition was moved around the landscape by migrating peoples, or in this case, nomads. And I think you can really see the resilience of those assumptions if we go to a key moment in the development of the history of dolmen studies. And that key moment is in 1985. Before 1985, scholars, including some very erudite scholars looking at the dolmen problem, had simply thrown their hands up in despair and said, look, until we can find a dolmen that's not been robbed out, there's no other way of solving the dolmen problem. Well, in 1985, not one, but two papers were published within a couple of months of each other, each claiming to have found an unrobbed dolmen and therefore solve the dolmen problem. The first was by the very well-regarded Jordanian archaeologist Khair Yassin, who dug a small sounding in front of a dolmen at Damia in the Jordan Valley. Excellent, he said. We can now solve the dolmen problem. A few months later, a paper was published by the Israeli archaeologist Claire Epstein, who was digging on the Jolan Plateau, and she said, found a couple of or several chambers unrobbed, and she said, brilliant, I can now solve the dolmen problem. But here's the rub. What they found inside these two different chambers dated almost a thousand years apart to different ends of the early Bronze Age. Now, the early Bronze Age, I think, as an early Bronze Age archaeologist specialist, is the most fascinating period in the history of the Levant. I think anyway. Why it's fascinating is because it, can, it sees for the very first time people living in concentrated urban settlements within fortified city walls, the first cities of Jordan. Now, Ker Yassin had found material from this dolmen that dated to the start of this period. Now, the Early Bronze Age is divided into four periods. The Early Bronze I, the Early Bronze II, the Early Bronze III, the Early Bronze IV. I'm going to be speaking about the Early Bronze I a lot, and I'm going to be calling it the EB1. That's a period that dates to about 3700 BC to about 3000 BC. And that's the material that Kerr Yassin found in the dolmen at Damia. That period is marked by increasingly complex village societies. But it's only in the very, very end of that period and then into the EB2, EB3 period that these first cities flourished. But something happened at the end of the EB3 and into the EB4 where that first urban experiment failed. Cities collapsed. Populations dispersed into the rural landscape and it became a village society again. And it's the end of that period, the EB4, that Claire Epstein found material in her dolmens on the Jolan Plateau. The very fact these is striking that both these data sets were accepted at face value, given they bookend a tremendous period of social change. No one, to my mind, has ever adequately explained how one burial tradition could remain in stasis for this entire time. But the fact that these data sets remained unchallenged, I think, is testament to the enduring tenacity of those assumptions. The dolmens are regional. The dolmens are enduring. And they can be attributed to nomadic peoples who operate outside these sort of urban patterns. But if we take a close look, I think actually we don't need to accept them all. 
because the dolmen in the Jolan that Claire Epstein had dug doesn't look like one of these stone table dolmens that I've somewhat disingenuously shown here. They came from much larger, much more elaborate, much more complex structures. Although they should call them dolmens, are we comparing apples to oranges? Actually, I think we're comparing a whole megalithic fruit salad, if you will. Claire Epstein defined six types of dolmens in a dolmen typology. And that typology underpins our dolmen approach and dolmens typologies that people use today. But if you look, there was only one type that looked like this standard stone table type dolmen that I showed you before. What's more, all the material dating to the EB4 that she found didn't derive from any of those stone table types. They derive from these three structures, types of structures here. Much larger structures built with long corridors that were semi-subterranean, semi-set into the ground and covered by large mounds of rubble. Completely different sorts of structures. The key question here, of course, is are they comparable? Were they built by the same people? To Claire Epstein, the answer was a resounding yes. And in her logic, you can still hear the same echoes of those two naval officers at Damia in 1817 explaining why European and Middle Eastern dolmens must be the same. To Claire Epstein, the use of large stone slabs was simply evidence enough to assume a common cultural context and she explained the various different forms as different tribal predilections of different nomadic groups. Now it's interesting here to compare the trajectory of dolmen studies in the Levant to the trajectory of dolmen studies in Europe because they're very very different. In 1950, the very famous British archaeologist Glyn Daniel had said, hang on guys, this word dolmen that we're using, it is an umbrella term that covers a whole range of different megalithic structures. And in fact, it's blurring any patterns that we can see. We have to be really careful. And so in Europe, the word dolmen really was restricted to just those stone table type structures. And the much larger structures, like these, were given a whole different sort of names. Gallery tombs, uh, corridor tombs, allier couvert in France. What if we restrict the term dolmen in the Levant to just these stone table-like ones, such as these here? Then I think we start to bring some e really interesting patterns into shape. And those patterns have some profound implications as to how we should interpret dolmens in the Levant. First up, the distribution of dolmens suddenly becomes very, very limited. This map shows the distribution of dolmens throughout the entire Levant. And you'll see that really, I think, they're only found in a strip about 150 kilometers long between the Jolan Plateau and the Madaba Plains on the east side of the Jordan Valley and about 100 kilometers east-west from the hills of northern Israel, southern Lebanon into the Syrian Lejar. What's more, I think dolmens are probably a lot more restricted in time. Now remember Kher Yassin found material from the EB1 at Damia, 3700 to about 3000 BC. Well, since 1985, several other projects have also found material in dolmens. Atel El Hammam, Adumairi, remember Umairi, we'll come back to that, it's spectacular. At Jebel Matawak and at Lilajar, all of which date to, you guessed it, the EB1. I think this fundamentally changes our perception of dolmens once we've established a precise definition where once we thought of something regional, rather, we're dealing with something local. Where once we thought of something enduring, rather, we're speaking about something short-lived. Ultimately, where once we said dolmens were a megalithic phenomenon, we're really dealing with a dolmen tradition, something local and discrete. 
And if we approach it that way, we don't need to seek out large scale mechanisms such as nomads or migrating people to explain their apparent ubiquity. Rather, we can approach dolmens far more contextually at a much finer grain resolution and say, well, how do they work in the archeological landscape of the early Bronze I period in the Southern Levant? But if we want to approach dolmens contextually at a finer resolution, doesn't that bring us all the way back to that dolmen problem? How can we do that if they're all found rods out? Is that even possible? Well, I think, yeah, absolutely it is. But we don't concentrate on what's not in them. We look at how they work in the landscape. So for the rest of this talk, I'm just going to focus on dolmens found south of Lake Tiberias. I think the patterns I'm about to outline hold for those ones along the north as well, but I'm happy to talk to anyone about that afterwards. Um, and th what you'll see is that dolmen, the distribution of dolmens cluster exclusively on the East Jordan Rift Valley escarpment. From the very edge of the Jordan Valley at the foothills, all the way up the side wadis to the edge of the Trans Jordan plateau and incidentally each of those dolmen symbols doesn't represent a single chamber they represent a cluster of dolmens some 10 12 monuments some several hundred the largest over a thousand now the first thing to note is that their distribution is constrained by the 250 millimeter iso height now that's one of the magic numbers that archaeologists look for because it's a signal People, doing, uh, people farming wheat and barley, living in areas that receive more than 250 millimetres of rainfall each year, can do so without having to irrigate. People living in areas less than 250 millimetres of rainfall a year need irrigation in order to farm these grains. And irrigation technology in the early Bronze I period was very poorly developed indeed. The fact that dolmens are constrained by the 250 millimeter ISO height, I think, starts to ring some bells in our heads. Rather than associating them with nomads who can move a bit more fluidly through the landscape, well, shouldn't we be associating them perhaps with farming villages instead? Well, here's the relationship between dolmens and early Bronze I villages, and I think the spatial correspondence is pretty convincing. In fact, I've looked at every single dolmen field that I can find, and I think all of them, every single one, is found within a kilometre, a kilometre and a half of an early Bronze I village. What's more, there's a direct correlation in size. Small dolmen fields of a few monuments are found near really small sites, maybe a couple of isolated farmsteads or a small village. Large dolmen fields of several hundred, several thousand dolmens are found near large sites or large clusters of densely occupied areas in the EB1 with large populations. But see that the situation's a little more complex because while dolmen fields are always found near EB1 settlement sites, not all EB1 settlement sites are found near dolmens. How do you try and explain that? Well, I think we need to look at something else here as well. And that's to look at the role of geology. What you're looking at here is a geological map by period of the late Cretaceous. So geological strata from 100 to about 70 million years ago. I find the geology of Jordan fascinating and complex and I'd love to talk to you about that for hours but I won't bore you. You really just need to know about four particular kinds of rock. So I'm going to talk about that rift escarpment coming up from the Jordan Valley. At the bottom is the oldest rock and I'm afraid it's not showing up here but this is this band here are sandstones and this is when this whole region was at the very edge of a continent and a river was depositing alluvium sand forming these very hard very uh, cement-like sandstones. Now, the sea level then rose and the whole region became a coral reef, kind of like the Barrier Reef or the Florida Keys today. And that turned into this dark green band called the Ajloon Limestone Formation. And that's a very hard, very macritic limestone. The sea level then rose again and the whole area became deep sea ocean, 
deep open water uh, pelagic environment. And that led to chalks and marls, very soft stones. Then later on, the whole place was terrestrial again. And of course, volcanic eruptions laid down lava, forming the Jolan Plateau, the Lajar, and Jordan's eastern Bardia. Dolmens are found on those areas of very hard rock, sandstone, hard limestones, basalt, and they're absolutely absent on those areas of soft rock, the chalks and marls. Well, almost. Except, of course, for the concentration of dolmens near Erbid, the Wadi Rayan, and the Jafane. What about those? Well, remember I said those soft rocks formed at a period of when, the, when it was a deep sea, open water ocean? There was one brief period in that when the sea level fell again and then rose very quickly. And in, when it fell, it became a coral reef once again. And that brief period formed the Amman silicified limestone. It's what you see when you walk out of the front door at Acor this evening. And it behaves exactly like this hard Ajalun limestone that you see in the upper Zarka. And that's where those dolmens correlate to exactly. So I'm just going to show you this relationship at a closer resolution here. So here you can see the dolmen fields around Urbit. Unfortunately, most of these have been destroyed now. Um, and down in the Wadi Rayan, where we'll come back to, there's a very close correspondence between those and the EB1 settlement sites. This was one of the most densely occupied areas in the fourth millennium BC. And if we overlay that onto the geology, you'll see the correspondence with that formation in blue. That's that hard Amman silicified limestone. And their absence on this much softer uh, chalks, marls, or in the yellow, which are areas where there's very deep soil. Incidentally, people living in early Bronze I settlements through here, of course, died and buried their dead, but they were burying them in shaft tombs or rock up tombs below the ground, not in dolmens above the ground. So if we pull all this together, I think we can look at dolmens a little bit differently. And I've proposed what I've called a settlement geology model. It's a really simple idea. And all it says is this. The dolmens were built by early Bronze Age I village communities, but only in areas of hard rock. In short, when these village communities were living on hard rock, they built chambers up. When they were living in areas of soft rock, they dug chambers down. And we can tie this to changes in society at the time. Now, at the end of the Calcolithic period, just before the early Bronze Age, most communities were living along the Jordan Valley with our farming cereal grains. But towards the end of that period, and then into the early Bronze Age I, communities traveled up the Rift Escarpment all the way up to the plateau, drawn up the, the side waddies. In part, there's a push factor. People were pushed to the edge of the Jordan Valley because there was a slight change in rainfall. There was, it was less reliable. So people moved to uh, perennial springs along the side waddies and clustered around perennial streams. But there's also a pull factor. Because this is the time that key tree crops that grow in these upland areas had been domesticated and were being exploited for the real first time. And I'm talking olive, grape, oil and wine, pomegranates, figs, things like that. These new economic opportunities pulling people up the side waddies. But they're also pulling people up into new geological zones. Now, I've taken you through all of this. I've spoken about the early Bronze Age one and the geology and all of this sort of stuff simply to get you to this one point. And that's to do with monumentality. Now, for the last 200 years, whenever scholars have talked about dolmens, the key defining characteristic they come back to again and again is their monumentality, their visibility. But according to this approach, actually, the very fact that dolmens are above the ground is a lot more prosaic. They're done where they have to be done and in areas where they can't be, tombs are buried below the ground. In short, 
by stressing the monumentality of diamonds, are we saying more about ourselves than we are about past societies? In fact, is there any real difference between above ground and below ground tombs at all? Now, remember I said don't forget that dolmen from Amiri. This is why. So, in the early 1990s, the Madaba Plains project were digging at the very bottom of the tell at Amiri on the edge of the Madaba Plains. And what they found, quite by accident, was a beautifully preserved dolmen. Its capstone had been removed or was missing, but the tell next to it had built up so fast and enough debris had spilled over the edge that the whole chamber had been sealed. And inside, the excavators found the human remains from uh, 20 to 25 individuals, all buried with their burial goods. And the burial goods, incidentally, were all perfectly legitimate early Bronze I materials. Here's the thing. It's quite clear that that dolmen had been accessed many times. That someone had been laid in, and then later on, when someone else had died, the remains were pushed to the back and someone else had been laid in. And then so on over many, perhaps many generations. That gives us a window, and it's really only the, the only window we have, into looking at burial practices within dolmens. And more importantly, we can compare those burial practices with what's going on in subterranean tombs at the same time. Now, I don't know if you've been down to Baba Dra, the Dead Sea, but the, the expedition to the Dead Sea Plains, uh, led by Walter Rass and Tom Schau, it's now been published by Meredith Chesson, did extraordinary work clearing a cemetery throughout the Early Bronze Age period. And we have a huge number of excavated Early Bronze I subterranean tombs in this area. All of them are cut down into the very soft miles, which then open up into an underground chamber. Here's the thing. All of them contain the remains of several individuals, probably all pushed to the back as someone else has been laid in. And in fact, the burial goods all look the same as well. Graham Phillip, who's a, a professor at the University of Durham, an early Bronze Age specialist, actually remarked, well, if the excavators at Baba Dra had been digging that dolmen at Amiri, they wouldn't have batted an eyelid because the remains, the, the tomb goods, were exactly the same. In short, as archaeologists, we've come at dolmens emphasizing the difference between above ground and below ground. But this suggests that perhaps those differences are blurred. Dolmens, I think, rather, we have to think about dolmens as part of a common burial tradition where the architecture changes according to the geology, but the funerary practices remain the same. So how does this affect the way that we should approach dolmens as archaeologists? Well, first up, the main thing I think is we really need to think of dolmen fields as cemeteries. In this way, and in fact, no different to cemeteries that are below the ground. And so I have a hypothesis, and it's been made before. The dolmen fields are in fact the upland counterparts, the upland cemeteries of those cemeteries in the Jordan Valley, which are cut below the ground. But how do we test that sort of hypothesis? How can we see if that's got legs or not? Well, archaeologists love to dig cemeteries because it gives you a fantastic window into understanding how societies were structured. If somebody is, of course, buried in a very elaborate tomb with very prestigious grave goods, and somebody is buried in a very poor tomb with virtually no grave goods, you can assume that somebody had access to resources and were higher up in the, the sort of food chain than the other person. There's a social hierarchy. Well, the expedition to the Dead Sea Plains team and Meredith Chesson working at Baba Dra have looked at those sorts of issues for the early Bronze One cemetery at Baba Dra, and they couldn't find any patterns whatsoever for this sort of social differentiation. All the tombs were the same. The way the dead had been treated was the same, and they were all buried with pretty much the same grave goods. In fact, Meredith goes so far as to say individual identities were being deliberately downplayed in order to emphasize the role of the community. 
And that's how I think we test that hypothesis if dolmens were the upland counterparts for lowland cemeteries. Can we see the same sorts of patterns for community over individual identities? But once again, we're back to that dolmen problem. Can we do that if there are no artifacts found inside? Well, this is the thing. The dolmen problem kind of has blinked us to the potential of dolmens here. To dig an entire cemetery like Baba Dra, you need a lot of time and a lot of money and to move a lot of dirt in order to expose a lot of the cemetery. But a dolmen field, you can walk the entire cemetery in the course of an afternoon. And you might not get fines, but you can ask different questions about the configuration of the cemetery that tells you some really neat information. The layout, the construction, the size, the shape of the various tombs, their aspects. And so I wanted to put my money where my mouth was and survey a dolmen field myself. And this is what I did as part of my PhD at the University of Sydney. And I did that by going up to the Wadi Rayan, formerly known as the Wadi Yabis, in North Jordan. The Rayan receives some of the best rainfall in Jordan. Its headwaters around Ajloun. There's a beautiful perennial stream that runs through the bottom. And at this time of year, it's covered in beautiful wildflowers, as I'm sure you have all know. And well, when I was an undergraduate student, one of my professors said to me, if you ever run a field project, make sure you do it somewhere nice. And I've remembered those words, and I think I have. And I'm about to go back to the Wadi Rayan to excavate an early bronze four, well, what I think is an early olive oil production site. And I've made sure I've left it for the early spring because, well, why do it at any other time? <laughs> but also there's some very rational reasons here as well. Now, the, sur the Wadi Rayan, as the Wadi Yabas, had been surveyed by Gaetano Palumbo and Jonathan Mabry in the 19. 80s and the early 1990s. And what they found was a whole proliferation of early Bronze Age 1 village sites being drawn up the side wadis, and in the middle, some very densely clustered fields of dolmens. And so I went to survey this field here. It's on a ridgeline called Tel Aras. That's the ridgeline that you can see along here. And it was beautiful to test this settlement geology model, because not only did it have the relationship with the settlements, but once again, a perfect relationship with that hard macritic limestone called the Amman silicified limestone. Now, if you stand on the Telarus Ridge, which is here, if you stand about here and you look out towards the Jordan Valley, that's what you see, a nice, steep-sided, beautiful wadi system. And if you turn around and look up the wadi, this is what you see looking the other way, all the way up the hills. And in fact, if we'd taken this on a clear day, you would see the castle of Ajloon on one of those peaks. I'll have to retake that photograph in the next few months, I think. What we did was grid out that ridge line into 50 by 50 metre squares and we surveyed all the archaeological features we could find. The red triangles are dolmens, but we surveyed rubble, rujum cans. Um, we even looked at the modern landscape to see how it affected the preservation of dolmens. And if you see those yellow triangles, each of those indicates a classical period wine press. That's the subject of a whole another lecture for some other time. We recorded 106 dolmens along the ridge and we recorded them to within an inch of their life. We photographed, we planned, we mapped, we sketched, we measured their capstones, their side stones, their end stones, their chambers. We described whether they were on a platform, whether they were surrounded by stone fences, how they related spatially and how they related visually to each other and to the landscape. And sure, we didn't find a single shirt inside any chamber. But that wasn't really the point. Because we were trying to ask, if we asked different questions of these dolmens, could we make these stones speak? Ultimately, we wanted to articulate were there any patterns in uh, how these tombs were configured individually and how these tombs were configured 
collectively in order to approach this dolmen field as a cemetery and so test that hypothesis. Well, what we found was that although dolmens are found all along the ridge, they tend to, to cluster in four discrete groups, A, B, C, D we've called them. Um, and that mirrors very neatly how cemeteries, early Bronze One cemeteries work in the Jordan Valley, at places like Baba Dra and at Jericho. Now at Baba Dra, because of the skeletal remains, um, and a very uh, interesting studies looked at the dental morphology. And that scholar has shown that those people buried within the same chamber are more likely to be genetically related than those people buried in different chambers. And there's a cultural mechanism when your grandfather dies determining whether you put him in that tomb over there and not that tomb over there. And I suspect that's what we're seeing in this spatial layout. The same sorts of family groups, this cultural mechanism in action. And just as that dolmen field had discrete groups in it, we have to remember that that whole Teller Russ ridge line was just one group within a much larger dolmen system. So you can see that's the Teller Russ ridge line here with the dolmens we surveyed. There were dolmens on the opposite side of the ridge and dolmens down here as well. Now this is a view shed analysis. This shows how many dolmens can be seen along the Telarus Ridge from other places in the Wadi Rayan. Those places that are red, you can see the most dolmens. Those places that are green, you can see the fewest dolmens. Those places that are grey, you can't see any dolmens at all. Now it was important to do this because some scholars have said, well, Dolmens are territorial markers. They're there to mark control over economic resources, water, grazing grounds, farmland, routeways through the landscape. Well, we looked at how they relate visually to all these economic resources and found that actually they didn't relate to any one of them. But they did relate to each other. All these various dolmen fields quite neatly spatially referenced themselves. You'll notice there's an absence of dolmens on this ridge. That's not because they're not there. I've not visited that ridge. In fact, no archaeologist has visited that ridge. That's terra incognita, archaeologically anyway. And I hope to go and have a visit and see what's there on one Friday off on this upcoming project. What I think, why I think this is important is because it shows us an emphasis perhaps on community that all these various upland villages, which you're seeing in these yellow squares, would have had alive networks of local trade, of intermarriage, and we're seeing those networks uh, enacted in the construction and the spatial relationship and the visual relationship between their tomb fields. But how were these dolmens configured individually? Were there distinct patterns that you could see to indicate a social hierarchy, or were they all the same like at the underground tombs at Baba Dra. Well, we looked at the size, the construction, the dimensions, the materials, and what we found was that, yeah, they're all the same. Now, I've got so many graphs. I won't bore you by showing you all those graphs. It bored me by making all those graphs. But this story is all the same, and that is that the size, the dimension, the ratio, all these sorts of things for the different slabs, the chamber, not only are they similar, but they're pretty much standardized. I think the dolmen builders had pieces of rope or lengths of arms or something in order to determine how these things looked. They're pretty identical, and that mirrors the situation of the underground tombs at Baba Dra. So, can we also take this a step further and talk about actual burial practices in the dolmens themselves? Well, fundamentally we can't because we didn't find any skeletons, of course, but there are a few clues. Now, remember the dolmen at Umairi was found with 20, 25 individuals that had been placed in, and then later on someone else came through, and then over time it built up. Well, if you look at the structure of the Umairi dolmen, You'll see that on the short side it has a very distinct back slab, but the front side is open. And the excavators, when they dug, actually found that that front side had been sealed 
by rubble all piled up and then covered with mud. A much more temporary closure. And I think that allowed people to dismantle it very easily, lay in the deceased of whoever died, build it up again, and then a few years later when someone else in the family had died, take it out and put somebody else into the chamber. Now, if you look at the dolmens in the Wadi Rayan, all of them have a single back slab at one end of the chamber. And if they cluster together quite close, it's always in the same back end as well. Now, we don't know, but I think this suggests that it's the same sort of situation, that the front ends would have been sealed by piled up rubble. And of course, when they were robbed out, the tomb robbers would never have reconstructed it. And so it's dispersed away. But that's what I think we're seeing there. So sure, we can at least make the argument that the burial practices were similar as well. Oh, and incidentally, you can see that, I think, particularly well at that dolmen field at Damia in the Jordan Valley. Damia is unique in the dolmen fields of the Levant because they have these porthole windows. The chamber is actually sealed by two slabs, but it's only in one slab, the entrance, that you get this window here. And sometimes you can even see the stone that had been removed that could be used to, to block that. The reason why they're at Damia is because Damia is unique in that it's built out of not limestone, not sandstone, not basalt, but by a different sedimentary stone, a very, very local outcrop called travertine. And travertine is easily worked because it breaks off in horizontal uh, slabs. And that, I think, w uh, allows those dolmen builders at Damia to actually construct a doorway like this. And this is a reconstruction of uh, one of those burial events done at Dami by the very talented artist, archaeological artist, Eric Carlson. So all of this together, I think, suggests that dolmens, like at Baba Dra, were made by early Bronze One village communities, emphasizing family, emphasizing community, and not emphasizing themselves, not emphasizing any sort of social hierarchy. Now that brings us right up against one of the key arguments made about dolmens, which is that, well, the very fact they're big stone monuments indicates they must have been made by an elite group, sort of tribal elite perhaps, because only the elite could command enough manpower and workforce to have these tomb monuments made. No one's really tested that idea, but this very close study we did in the Wadi Rayan, I think, at least gave us some clues. Now, I think I've, I think I've understood how these dolmens were built, at least in the Rayan. Let me build up the clues with you, and then you can make up your own mind. Now, remember how I said the dolmens were all standardized? They all of them have these features. They're all made from the local limestone. And when I say local, it's the limestone they're standing on. They haven't come from very far. The capstones always have this wedge shape. They're thicker at one end, they come down much thinner at another end. The capstone is always rough on the top, just like the sort of surrounding exposed bedrock, but always smooth underneath. The side stones of the chamber are always smooth on the inside and could be smooth or rough on the outside. And really interestingly, there's very often nodules of flint that you can see embedded on the edges of these stones. Also, there are clues if you look beyond the dolmens themselves, because the whole ridge line, when you start to look at it, is an actual quarry scape. The whole ridge line has been cut up in order to make these dolmen slabs. Can you see these sort of lines of benches here? These, I think, are all the extraction points, the quarries where the slabs have been removed. And so the whole ridge is kind of stepped down like that. So when the dolmen builders were building these dolmen fields, not only are they transforming the landscape by building the dolmens up, they're transforming the landscape by cutting it away at the same time. And we found several of these quarry scars that were left behind. Now, can you imagine sort of picking up one of those capstones like a piece of Lego and fitting it back onto here? And I think you can see how they were built. So imagine that the bedrock, like here, would have sloped all the way down like this. And if you'd remove that, what would you get? Well, you'd have got a triangular wedge-shaped piece of stone 
with a rough top and a very smooth underside. And can you see the nodules of flint all in the rock? Mirroring the nodules of flint underneath as well. And in fact, look at that groove, because we'll come back to that in just a moment. What I think the dolmen builders were doing was simply finding exposed pieces of bedrock and benching it along and extracting it until it had been worked out. Not a particularly difficult thing to do. Now, if you stand about there above this quarry scar and look down this way, this is what you see. So that's the top of that quarry that I just showed you. And there is a dolmen about 10, 15 meters down slope where I reckon those slabs would have been rolled. Now, when I was doing this field project, my girlfriend at the time, she's now my wife, is an archaeologist as well, she was working with me, and her parents were visiting for a couple of days. And they were visiting when we were actually surveying here. And see this flat stone? Well, I stood on top of that, pontificating like an idiot, saying, if only we found one that had been half quarried away and then abandoned, that would solve everything. And my now mother-in-law, looked at me, looked at the stone I was standing on, looked at me and went, Jamie, you really are an idiot. I think you're standing on one. <laughs> and like a thousand times since, she was absolutely right. <laughs> so this is what I'm going to show you in a little more detail. Here's that slab. You can, I think it's had already had a stone slab removed off the top where it's quite flat. Can you see these two very deeply grooved channels? Well, I think we had one that was half quarried. And so we excavated around it, both above it and below it. Um, uh, here is Amjad Batane, by the way, from the Department of Antiquities, uh, who was our rep that year and really wonderful guy to work with. What we found was that the dolmen had almost been entirely undercut. In fact, if you drew a line all the way along here, the stone would be floating. It was completely undercut. But this was the really interesting thing. What had been removed from underneath here, and what was still standing in two corners, was a seam of flint, the suwan. Now remember that this is part of the Amman silicified limestone. That's really characteristic for having big beds of limestone with interbedded bands of flint. And what the dolmen builders were doing, I think, was quite deliberately targeting these flint beds and by removing the flint could completely undercut the stone. And in fact, from the excavations beneath it, we found hundreds, thousands of small, sharp, brittle flint bits, bits of debris that had been used for, by when they bashed the, the flint away. So if we put all that together, I think we can start to recreate a sequence. So this photograph was taken from standing on top of the dolmen looking up along here. And what you can see is one slab that had been abandoned, probably because it's dipping too far down here. You can see the deep grooves on either side and completely undercut. The scar that had been left up above from some successful ones. Remember I said that groove? I think that's where the flint had been removed from. And then, of course, rolled down to the dolmen down below. So we can start to make a sequence. The dolmen builders targeted a shelf of bedrock where they could see some flint down the bottom, probably measured it up, grooved an outline into that groove, I suspect, placed wooden wedges soaked with water to expand until they could get down to this flint seam beneath. Now, how they removed the flint, I don't know, but I wonder. I bet they would have heated that up with fire to a very hot temperature thrown on some water and that sudden change in temperature would have fractured that flint very nicely, causing all those debris and those chips that we found. Ropes could then be passed underneath the dolmen slab and it's at that stage we found the dolmen slab in the rayon and it could be pulled down the hill and placed into position. Of course, the key question here is did this process have to be coordinated by an elite group? Did this in itself indicate some sort of social differentiation? Or could it be done by family groups? 
Well, no one's really looked at it in Jordan, but this issue has been debated a lot in Europe and in Egypt and uh, in Central Asia about the movement of large stone. So I unashamedly robbed or borrowed some of these calculations that other scholars had made and plugged in some of the dimensions of the dolmens and the rayan. The key thing is that the capstones weigh on average about four tons. The side stones weigh on average one and a half tons. Now, depending on whose calculation you plug those into, pretty much you get the answer that between 15 and 40 people could have made a dolmen. Fewer if there was a couple of donkeys involved. 15 to 40 people and a couple of donkeys, to me, sounds like Christmas dinner at the Fraser household. An extended family group. I think that it was absolutely within the range of a family group to do this. And in fact, if you look at ethnographic studies of dolmen monuments, such as this taken in Sumatra in 1915, well, it suggests that maybe we're kind of, by looking at these numbers, we're thinking of it the wrong way. Sure, we have to look at the minimum number of people to try and break that connection with the elite. But actually, these ethnographic studies suggest that really it's the maximum number of people that could take part that's important. That the very process of, and these are some dolmens that are still built today in Indonesia, the very process of bringing people together to create these community structures in itself helps bond communities together. That's why I, how I think we need to start thinking of dolmens in Jordan. Not as monuments serving to underscore difference, but rather monuments who, through their very construction, helped promote unified communities. So I think I've probably bored you long enough, and we've all got a really fantastic supper to go and pay attention to. I just want to end by saying this. When I started, I said, do you remember if you open a book today, the most current model that you read about is dolmens as a megalithic phenomenon. What I've tried to do is outline an alternate approach, saying that rather than a regional enduring megalithic phenomenon, these dolmens, and particularly in Jordan where most are found, are probably local, probably discrete, part of a local burial tradition that we have to understand in context with other burial traditions as well. But ultimately, I hope, I've challenged the dolmen problem. I think that dolmen problem is a creation of our own making. Because I think if we approach the dolmens in the right way, and if we interrogate them with the right questions, then actually we really can make these stones speak. Thank you so much.